Hello. Hi. Welcome. I'm Melissa Silverstein. I'm one of the co-founders of the festival. Welcome to our second to last activity of uh, the 2014 Athena Film Festival. I'm so excited to see you all here. On behalf of the Athena Center for uh, Leadership Studies and Women in Hollywood, I want to just welcome you to the 2014 Athena Film Festival, a celebration of women in leadership. Fantastic to see you all in this room. I'm so excited to do this Works in Progress program because it's one of the dreams of the Athena Film Festival is not only to showcase films, but to help films happen. And um, we're not a gigantic festival, but we can do what we can do. And last night we talked about the Athena List, which are four feature narrative scripts that need to be made. And today what we are showcasing are three documentaries that are in the process of being made. And we have amazing people who are giving their time to help these filmmakers um, and inspire them and help them get to the next level. And people involved in the film are all in the room. And you as the audience will react to their clips, their works in progress, and help them think about things maybe a little bit differently. So when they walk out of here, they're like psyched and inspired. And then next year, we'll be showing your movie here at the Athena Film Festival. So <laughs> this festival would not be possible without the wonderful sponsors. And you saw that scroll. I'm going to particularly mention uh, Regina K. Scully, who is our founding sponsor, and the Artemis Rising Foundation, which she is the founder and CEO. This program is sponsored by the amazing Chicken and Egg Pictures. Um, if you don't know Chicken and Egg, and Judith Helfand is going to come up here and talk a little bit about Chicken and Egg. Um, if, you're document if you're a female documentary filmmaker and you don't know Chicken and Egg, you must know Chicken and Egg. Um, they are the premier institution that helps guide uh, women filmmakers uh, in the documentary field. But particularly, uh, Judith has been such a help in putting this together and helping me hone the vision a little bit on this. And she's a filmmaker um, as well as a principal at um, founder of um, Chicken and Egg. You're going to hear more about her because she's going to be participating on the, in the discussions. But she's going to talk for a brief moment about um, why Chicken and Egg is working with the Athena Film Festival. Thank you, yeah. darling. I think you have a lab. So you're oh, good. I have a lab. Shout out to Melissa. Don't hide. Thank you. So, so, she's a fierce force of nature, and um, I just this film festival just gets better and stronger and more intuitive and more innovative every year, and I'm really, really impressed. Um, and the reason why we're sponsoring. Um, Today, this works in progress session is because it's really the it's it's the spirit and the and the guts and um, it's sort of the heart of what Chicken and Egg Pictures do, does. Our tagline is incubating and hatching all at once since 2005, and that's what we like to do. Um, we provide money and we provide mentorship, um, and I think the the best organizations that are working in the field today, and there's many, many, many of them, and we're proud to be part of a great team, including POV, um, and including a um, you know, just films, and including a lot of the kinds of organizations who've been investing in the movies that you've seen um, this weekend. Um, no one just really likes to give money anymore. Um, it's really about building community. It's about supporting collaboration. And it's about supporting an ecosystem of, um, of, of change. Um, and it's really about sort of supporting people at each step of the process of making a movie. So what you're going to see today, and why we're so excited about this, are films that are in different stages of development and production. And I just, I think today is a, it's, it's about transparency. So all of the people that are going to be getting up to give feedback, we're all going to be trying to give the kind of feedback that we would give if we were on the telephone, if we were having a workshop, if it was a one-on-one, -on -one, if, if it was a group lab session. 
we just want you to get a sense of the kind of off the cuff from the heart um, and from the brains kind of input that we can all give um, as editors or as funders or as filmmakers, as storytellers, um, of people who deeply believe um, in our colleagues and in our sister filmmakers. So that's the spirit of today and that's the spirit of why um, we're a proud sponsor of Athena and I hope we'll continue to do that. So um, we have a phenomenal um, mediator. Mediator? Moderator. Moderator. I hope you don't have to mediate anything. I don't think it's gonna get, I don't think it's gonna get that hot and bothered that you're gonna have to mediate, but it could happen. This could get really exciting. It could. Okay. <laughs> and here you are. So welcome. Okay, hi. Okay, uh, I'm Cindy Stivers. I volunteered to do my own introduction so I could be quick because I know my bio by heart. Um, actually I went to and I get to sit down, which is exciting. Um, I'm a proud Barnard alum, class of seventy-eight. And, uh, and also trustee, uh, so I, I am extra proud of the Athena Film Festival and its success so far. I'm also personally really passionate about the film business. I covered Hollywood and the indie business for Premiere Magazine for many years and various other places. Um, when I helped uh, get Time Out New York started in New York in 1995 and ran that for the next 10 years, we made sure that we listed every single indie film that was playing in New York City at any minute of the day. That was a key um, part of what we tried to set out to do there. And I was also on the board of IFP for a few years. So anyway, that's pretty much it. I'm now working with Tina Brown Live Media. And uh, so anyway, enough about me. To discuss again, I, these guys did my job for me in explaining what the panel is, so I will not take any more time with that. But I do want to just tell you one more format thing. We're going to have the filmmaker come up, give a five minute pitch, so you really get this is what they're passionate about and this is what they need from you. Then we're going to show clips about five minutes. Then uh, during those, our panelists will get mic'd and they'll come up, we'll do about 15 minutes with them, and then we want to throw to you. So if you have a reaction to what you've seen, if you have suggestions to what you've seen, you can personally help in any way, the filmmakers will be eager to hear from you, okay? So our first filmmaker is Margot Guernsey. Come on up, and we're gonna hand you the, this one. Are you loud, or in the meantime, this will, this will be best. Okay, Hello. Okay, yes. Okay. Well, you can. I can. Okay. Yeah, do you want to come up so people can see you really well? There you go. Oh, and we are being live streamed too, so if you do say things, we're going to have to run a mic to you. Just telling you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Is this, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, so my film is Councilwoman Castillo. It's about a woman who is a city councilwoman in Providence, Rhode Island, and her day job is cleaning hotel rooms. We've been following her ever since she won her election. It was a special election in 2011 and plan to continue shooting through this fall when she'll be up for re-election. Uh, so the film is very much her journey. Um, told, it will be told primarily in her voice. It's a bilingual film because that's her world. Um, but it's also very much a, a film about our democracy and what, how might our public policies change if we elected um, people who are working manual labor jobs. That's more than 50% of America works those jobs, but you could count them on your hand how many politicians are working jobs like that. And so the act of her running for office and her winning and her running for re-election are in and of itself a claim or a stake to power. But we're gonna, the film will follow her first four years in office. And so we'll be with her as she learns the hard way, some hard things, learns, you know, has good moments. She's, you know, she's grown a lot. I've seen her grown a lot as a leader since she's been in office. And so the film will take us on that journey with her. Um, there are some other characters, some of whom you'll see in the clips. Her campaign manager, who, uh, who is also her union organizer, the hotel she works at is a unionized hotel. Um, and you will also see some, uh, I don't know if it's in this clips, but the other state representative from her ward happens to also be a Dominican woman. And they work very closely together, and she will be in the film. Um, as will, one thing that happened as we started shooting is that another hotel in downtown Providence, the workers there started to try to organize a union and they have not one recognition, but they're all, they're very much her peers. They're Dominican, they're, they're mostly the housekeeping department. And so we've been, she's been very out in front in supporting their efforts and so we've also been following their struggle as it unfolds. 
Um, so we have, we, we're, I'd say we've shot at least half the film, but we have a lot more production to go. Um, we've, we're really, we've really been gearing up since, I'd say, a few months ago, and we'll be shooting a lot from now through the fall. Um, so we both need to finish getting the film shot and raise the money for our post. Um, our director of photography is here, Nikki Bramley, so if you have any questions specifically about the shooting, I'd like to include her in this. Um, and, uh, but I wanted to, uh, one thing that I'd love to hear from both the panel and the audience is um, feedback or, res or responses to the story structure or the, in the story itself. Because that's something that as an independent filmmaker I have to talk to myself a lot about and would love to have a broader conversation. And we're also still shooting, there's a lot of room for small adjustments as we choose what, what to shoot and what not to shoot. So. And just so you know, I will fill you in a little bit more on Margot's bio when we sit down. Okay, I just thought you wanted to get into it. Okay. Okay. So should I? So how does now, Melissa? Okay. Good. Perfect. Cada ser humano tiene su principio y, y yo creo que en la política eso se pierde y eso es lo que yo no quiero que pase conmigo. A mí nadie, nadie va a hacer conmigo lo que quiera ni nadie me va a comprar y eso va para todos. Carmen, I think the difficulty is going to be understanding how slow government works. You know, you come in having one, you're eager to begin to do the work, and then you sort of get stuck in the quicksand of government, and things don't move as quickly as you want, and um, or as quickly as you think they should. En verdad, aprendí un poquito más acerca de de lo que el marín de lo que yo creo que le interesa a todos los siliconzos es el dinero. A mí de verdad no me interesa el dinero, pero... Mm, tengo que entender cómo trabaja lo del dinero para yo saber cómo voy a distribuir ese dinero. Por fin se paró para que yo cruce, Dios mío, soy increíble. O oh, es alguien que me conoce. <risa> ok. So, por eso me dejó pasar porque quería, quería decirme algo. Um, he estado en mi calle. Me da tristeza ver que tengo una de las primeras cerradas en la esquina. Ahí trabajaba siete personas. mucha cosa bonita, tiene mucho parque, mucha área de recreamiento para los niños y también tiene la otra cara, tiene mucha gente pobre, mucha gente sin trabajo, mucha gente que no, uh, que no sabe qué hacer. Aquí todo esto como nueve acres, que eso era una fuente de empleo, no tenemos nadie trabajando ahí. Es triste ver el desempleo. I am from the Dominican Republic. 
I'm coming to Providence in 1994 with my three little girls. People say, you know, she don't speak a good English. She don't got a high education. She can do anything in the city hall. She's a room attender in the hotel. The only thing she can do is clean room. They do a lot of talking and talking and talking. I say, so what? Too many people believe in me. Siempre lo he dicho, soy un político ahora, pues yo veo que siempre he sido una activista social, luchando por justicia. En este momento yo estoy pensando en los trabajadores de Renacer. A pesar de que quieren luchar, tienen mucho miedo. Ya vamos a la lucha. Mira Santa. Yo sé el nombre de la persona y los números del teléfono. Y hay que insistirle para que, para que vengan. Sí, sí, sí. Es santa, amor. Necesitamos tu presencia. La necesitamos. Y ya casi estamos ganando. Casi estamos ganando. Y ya. Tu presencia. Tu presencia vale. Tu presencia vale. Nos vemos ahorita. Bye. <risa> dijo que no que va a ver, va a ver después dijo que sí que sí ni el frío, ni la lluvia, ni la nieve ni nada puede detenernos ¿sabe por qué? porque este es el momento este es el momento donde nosotros hemos decidido luchar por nuestro derecho y no le podemos coger miedo ni el frío, ni el nada I think this is our moment, please. Yeah. Okay, come on up, group. I'll get out of the way and I'll go in last. So I'll start telling you. So Margot, uh, who you met briefly a moment ago, is a freelance producer and editor uh, working from on everything from micro documentaries and language learning videos to corporate advertising. But this is, of course, uh, her magnum opus for today. Uh, and that's her company, Time Travel Productions. And is there still a chair left? Yes, it is. Okay, good. You <laughs> uh, It doesn't matter. I just, I'll probably, there. Okay, good. Great. Because I have my cough drops in case I choke. <laughs> uh, just getting over a cold. Anyway, so your prior work includes the award winning um, documentary short, The Bonus March, um, before moving to Boston. Um, you worked as a producer for Kid Vision VPK, a uh, program developed by WBPT, Miami's PBS station, and uh, where you produced these educational videos for pre-K teachers. Um, as you know um, from watching this movie, she is bilingual <laughs> in Spanish and English. She has an MFA in directing from the University of Miami, an MA in history from the University of Am uh, from UMass Amherst, and a BA in history from Brown. Uh, and before that, she worked, before all of this, but after school, she worked in nonprofit fundraising as a Spanish English teacher and a union organizer. Okay, so then we jump to Judith, who you've heard a little bit about from her own mouth. Uh, she co founded Working Films with Robert West in 1999. She describes herself as a filmmaker organizer. And she's been doing 
documentary producing and education for the past 10 years. Um, she and George Stoney co-produced and co-directed The Uprising of 34 in 1995. All right, very good. Uh, she, her film with Dan Gold, Everything's Cool, uh, about global warming, premiered at Sundance in 2007 and was broadcast on Sundance Channel the following year. And she is, as you now know, um, co-founder of Chicken and Egg. And your latest film is Cooked. Right. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And now, Maria. Maria Aggie Carter. Um, has is an independent filmmaker also based in Massachusetts, so we have a lot of people who came down. Thank you very much. Born in Ecuador. Um, she also worked at um, but a Boston public TV station, WGBH. Um, in 1989, she produced um, many um, documentaries for their Latino series, La Plaza. Uh, her film, The Devil's Music, aired in 2000 on PBS as part of Culture Shock, a series she helped develop. Um, and then there's a long period where she was named fellow and all kinds of distinguished scholar things at Harvard and Tulane and all of that. But the most important thing is that she wrote and produced 12 films. Um, most recently in the past year, Rebel, uh, about a Cuban woman soldier and spy. Um, she wrote, directed, and produced. That premiered on PBS in the past year. And you might have seen it last night. Is there anyone here who saw it? Great. Okay, and she also produced No Job for a Woman on PBS this year. And finally, but not least, Cynthia, <laughs> Cynthia Lopez um, is executive vice president and co-executive producer of POV, the American documentary portion of POV, um, which has media partnerships with Harpo, New York Times, ABC Nightline, Al Jazeera, all sorts of amazing people. <laughs> Um, and during, uh, she's also the recipient of nine news and documentary Emmy Awards. Those are, those are her, her biggest things. But, you know, I think it is major that POV was one of the only 13 nonprofits to get the million dollar MacArthur Genius Grants um, for nonprofits. So, anyway, a distinguished panel who can all help Margot out a lot. So let's get started with the basic, um, the basic ask, whatever you, you know, your basic ask was about um, the story arc. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? Do you want to go start, Jude? Yeah. Um, sure. You know what, I, th I think actually I watched this again before I, I came and I watched it a couple of weeks ago um, for the first time and Melissa shared it with me. I think it's extraordinary and I think she's amazing and I've never seen a character never seen a person like her before on television, and I've never met her before in my life. So she's undoing, um, she's undoing every stereotype and upending everything that I know about people who work in hotels, and I think that's extraordinary. And so my first offer to you is that you need to save the reveal. You're going to have to think about where the reveal comes in. So just a good, even for any pitch reel that you do as you raise money, I totally believe this woman can win because she just said, she made this, she said, I can't bought, I can't be bought, I won't be sold, right? And so, and then she wins. Of course she wins because she's so ethical. So I would want you to say she wins and then slowly bring up, and she happens to work in the hotel industry, you know, and she, and she's a hotel attendant. But right now it's like all in the same line. And I think like, that's, of course she won. And then, oh. The other thing, it's like, again, the other reveal for me in here is when she says, um, I, I've learned a little bit from this whole process. People want, you know, they're interested in the money, but I'm interested in the neighborhood and then how the money should be spent. I'd rather see her do that before the man talks about how she's going to be frustrated that things go slow once you're inside the halls of City Hall. Because every time someone talks for her, I'm sort of back, like, kind of watching, like, she's wallpaper and someone else is speaking for her. Every time she undoes one of her, she undoes it for me. It's like, wow. So I want to understand, like, of course he says that about her because he understands her drive. But I need to understand her drive and see it and feel it before someone comments on her being frustrated by the process. So I think that that's going to be the, your greatest challenge and your greatest ally is how you debunk, support, you know, reveal, and like sort of let her lead. And the last thing I'll say is, and I know you had to shorten the piece, but 
there's this moment at the end, as I recall, when all of the other legislators walk in, like she's used all of her power as someone who's been elected, and she gets all these other people to come to the, and it's early in the morning, and it's freezing, and it's raining, right? It was late in the afternoon, but it's freezing and raining. It's freezing and raining, all right. <laughs> and then all of these people from City Hall, all of the other commissioners, they start coming in, and they're like, of course, Councilwoman Castillo, of course I would, I would be here for your union organizing tribe, right? And they're all shaking our hands, and they all agree, and they, she basically makes them like shake on the fact that they're going to support these workers, and they'll get a contract or whatever it is. So I think that at that, that moment, we get to see all of the fusion of her organizing and her power and how she's shifting power and she's utilizing it too and she's playing all sides and it's great so just never cut that out whatever you have to do again in any pitch reel you ultimately have to show that I love the premise Uh, I love being introduced to this Latina woman character who will break all kinds of stereotypes. Uh, From a production standpoint, I'm curious about a couple of things. Uh, She seems to lose about 50 pounds between the first Mm. scene and the second scene. And so I'm thinking structure, you know, how how do you you, uh, use some of those early early interview material, and then you see this massive, massive physical change. Are you going to uh, follow her uh, and use time, at the chronology, as your structure? Uh, but sometimes that doesn't serve you uh, well. Sometimes you have more uh, interesting uh, reveals and moments in history that you want to go to. And so my question was this. It's true what Luisa Ponte, uh, the other councilman, says that the work of politics is very slow, incremental, and rather boring oftentimes when you're following it. So the question for me would be, think about what your touch points are going to be. Is it really whether she wins another election? Is it some specific campaign? Has it already happened? You know, sometimes you come into a story in the middle and you need to structure your film differently than it actually happened. So the question about how you're going to play out her story beyond the initial premise, because that will hold you for a few minutes, and then you have to go with her. And as a human being, perhaps, there might be some, uh, some uh, challenges that she has to face. Maybe the weight thing is part of that transformation. Maybe, you know, I, I don't know enough about her yet, but look for those and then look for which your structural harp high points are going to be. What is it that's going to drive me to watch for an hour? Because that premise is your start, but it's not your end. How long is her term, by the way? Is she? Uh, how long will she be in office? Her, she won in a special election, so her first term will only be three and a half years, and then it's a four-year cycle. So I'm just wondering if that would be creating urgency for you to finish or not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, Cynthia, do you have anything? Congratulations. I know it's really hard in front of a big group on a Sunday afternoon when they want to go see full films later on to take this on and to, to do this pitch at this time. So congratulations, you did a great job with explaining what it is that you want to accomplish and what you need from us. There's a couple of things. From POV's perspective, I would say, when I first, I didn't want to, re- I, I try when I come to these sessions not to read everything, not to see everything, to come, every, to come fresh. But as soon as you said council person, uh, Congress, account, she's a ca- council person, she's Latina, I said, okay, th- that sets some, something up for me, right? And I, I was expecting electoral race. So I'm ready for a race, but I'm a little bit at the starting gate. So how you finesse the arc of even showing you know, rough cuts to people like me, who are expecting a ray, you know, looking at one, how did this woman uh, on the tough side, while I agree with Judith, she's a vivacious woman, she won, she this, she that. As a critic, I would say, me, I would say, is she qualified? Why, you know, why is this person from who is a, you know, domestic worker for a hotel, you know, like why would she be qualified compared to another Latina woman in that community? So that raised a question for me. So, but to say how to answer that question in a way that doesn't give everything away is something that I think you're going to have to find a solution to because a lot of people would say, wait a second, she must have had a strong uh, base of support, but where is it? Because I didn't see it. 
I saw the, the union organizing stuff, but her base of support on wh what did she run on? Who, you know, who supported mm -hmm. her? And was it a diversified community that supported her? Because as we know, to get any government <laughs> you know, position, if you don't have a diversified you know, support, you're not gonna make it. So there has to be some people from various levels, various classes that are interested in her being in this position. And that is the itch that I wanna scratch. That is what I wanna understand in terms of the storyline. So I would just say, you know, I was ready for a race, but I'm at the starting gate. How do, how do you help me with that? Second piece I'd say is the reveal that, that Judith was talking about. When exactly do you reveal what she's gone through that she's won? And that's a question for you to answer. And then the third is the heartbeat. You know, I have to say as a larger woman, I, I was like, oh wow, she lost weight. And I got stuck on that. Instead of like, what is her political notice. platform? <coughs> and I'm like, you know. So then I had to go back and say, did she tell me her political platform and I got stuck on her weight? Like, you know, what happened? So I just have to oh, say, God, yeah. just as a woman. It was Latina. a weight mattress platform. <laughs> what? <laughs> a weight, no, no. I'm not actually not in just I got as a viewer because again I'm someone at POV that oftentimes our production team comes in with the film and they love it for this reason or they love it for that reason and I'm the naysayer who's like 10 o'clock on Monday night who's going to watch that you know is this going to really you know capture an audience that we want to capture. And for myself, when I look at a piece like this, I think you have organizers that would be interested in this. You have local government people that would be interested in this. Yes, you have Latinos, but unless you really explain what the political, what her political agenda is, mm -hmm. you'll have Latinos like me saying, is she qualified? How did she get to where she is? Why would I care to, you know, if you know anything about Nedia Velasquez and there are other very strong people mm -hmm. in government, uh, you know, how did she make it? How, what connections does she have to these other people is another question. The other thing, the, the last thing I'd say is just, you know, you have that scene where she says, oh, how sad it is to see unemployment in Rhode Island. But you're seeing these empty buildings, which I get what the metaphor that you're going for. But for me, I, often at POV, I talk about heartbeat. We are really about showing the face of the people who are experiencing a certain human condition. And so I'd rather see what someone is going through in the Latino community that's unemployed and then seeing that kind, you know, sort of the vacuum of uh, industry leaving because we've seen that image a lot. And I bet you with the material that you have, you probably have those stories. So I'd like, uh, there's two things that I wanna do is get to know her better, get to know why she lost weight, get to know her political agenda, and then get to know her community. What? So I'll yeah. stop there. Okay. But congratulations. Um, yeah, we do want to do questions. And then I think while we do one question for you, I also think it might be interesting to ask, um, if you don't mind, Melissa, maybe are there, is there any aspect of what these three women just said that you want to quickly ask a follow-up question about before we throw it to the audience? So we give you guys 30 seconds or so to to uh, formulate and I anything have a you want to say. Question also, an important question for her. Um, I don't have any. I mean, it all makes a lot of sense to me. I I could I can answer the questions about the weight and some other things, but I think it might not be the best use of time. Right. So. Yeah. Okay, but everyone, you guys can decide if you want to hear the weight story. Which other question, Maria? So my question is, um, can you talk about your team and um, who are the lead creatives? Is there anyone? from the Latino community uh, or who is Latino uh, or, or speaks, community. yeah, or, yeah, um, who, who is a sort of insider, um, how are you getting that, uh, uh, that story? Mm -hmm. And who is it that's leading this creatively? Mm -hmm. I mean, quite frankly, I'm leading it crea creatively. I've been, from the beginning, looking for people from the neighborhood and mm -hmm. Latinos. Um, but the way the story has sort of developed, um, well, actually, take that back. Our editor is Latino. <laughs> so we do now have, and who, who, who cut all these scenes. Mm -hmm. So he's come onto the team recently, which is why I had that slip up. Mm -hmm. um, but he's, we've worked together very well, and he will cut the film. So, um, so he's the key piece of the creative team who is Latino. Mm -hmm. I have a better 
feeling for the neighborhood, frankly, than he does, because mm -hmm. I knew Carmen long, long, long before she ran and know a lot of the players, including people like Luisa Ponti. And mm -hmm. So I have, I think, probably more than he does a beat on the, the neighborhood. Um, and um, so the, um, so, so it's me. So the team would be is me and him and Nikki, who's our DP, and who we've struggled with the fact that she she's an amazing photographer, videographer, does not speak Spanish, and we've bridged that gap with me essentially. Um, mm -hmm. So and um, it's working, it's working, you know. Do you live there, or how do you know the neighborhood so well? I lived there for many years. Uh -huh. I don't live there anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh -huh. So, so yes, audience, could we? So is someone going to run mics? Here we have a question in the second row here. Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hi. Uh, I think this is a very exciting story, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the whole thing. I think maybe a piece that would give some of her background is when she came from the Dominican Republic, was she an activist there, or did she come from an activist family? And the other question I wanted to know is, was sort of those techniques of how did she get people to vote? How did she get her base to actually vote? Mm -hmm. Do we have another? I think she has her hand up so. there. Thank you very much. I'm very excited about this and very excited about the film. But there's a couple of reasons why, but I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm gonna, I, I want to address the weight loss situation. I run campaigns. I'm a labor lobbyist. I'm an organizer and an advocate at heart. And I helped elect the first woman in New York City from the building trades, a young woman at 30 in 2008 in a highly Republican district. Major, major upset, and, and we did it in 2008. So um, what I'd say about the weight is like anybody who's really running a campaign loses weight. It's like an automatic. You want to lose weight, guys? Run for Run office. For office. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. an automatic. Darn. Do we know this? Exactly. <laughs> can, can. In fact, you know, knowing this already, when you everybody here says, "Oh, she lost weight," and I'm like, "I really didn't notice because maybe I'm just so used to it that you know it just happens." So, um, so that's that's. But one of the things that I would advise is the composition of our district. Is it 20 percent, 40 percent, 60 percent Latino? Who are they? And then, of course, her opponent. Did she have opposition? What kind of an opposition? Was the op was the opposition experienced legislator? Was he of the same race? Was he or she, you know, <laughs> older, younger? Did he or she speak English perfectly? Um, you know, and also the results. What was the composition? My candidate in 2008 won by. 27 lost the first election by 27 votes, but won the election I got involved in by 378. So, you know, or when did she come to the race? I was also recently involved in the Manhattan Borough President's race, and Gail Brewer actually won the election. She's our Manhattan Borough President, and she came in very late in the race when people looked at us and said, You're crazy. She's not going to make it. And we said, Okay. <laughs> you know, so I'll have more questions later. I'm sorry. I don't want to. Okay. Make it. Okay. We amazingly see we have more questions, but like this is our, this is our executive executive producer. <laughs> we'll figure out a way. I think we have to we have to pause on questions because it's ten to four, and we got it hard out of here at five. We got two more. So what I think we're going to do is ask people to write their questions now and. Then Margo might be interested in, in those questions. And we can either do it by email or another way, because I don't want to interrupt the interaction, but I want everyone to get their time. Okay. So All right, so can we give Margo a big Hi. round of applause, please? Yay! <laughs> Are you going to stay? I mean, often in a pitch setting like this, you know, if there was time, the question would be like, so chicken and egg, do you think she should apply to you for the next open call? Chicken and egg. Yes. <laughs> and, I, and I think you should. So I, I, I think your project's really extraordinary, and um, it's something I would love to see get done. And what do you think, POV? Shouldn't she, don't you think she should This is definitely a POV, yeah. and we, um, there is a development. And, uh, diversity. Yeah, there's a diversity fund, so I can uh, talk to you about that for sure. And do you know about Nalip? Yes. 
Yes, and Nalip uh, has workshops, professional development workshops and connectors like the Latino Media Market, uh, which is happening in June at our annual conference. You should apply to that and to our Producers Academy, which we call the Latino Sundance 10 Days Residential with people who help you workshop a project. That's great. And for those who don't know, Nalip is National Association of Latino <laughs> Independent Producers. Mm -hmm. And okay. they're like the ground floor of Nalip. <laughs> <laughs> Bring the panelists down. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to skip. Yeah. Oh, Don's next? Oh, okay. Yeah, Marlene. I was good. Good. That's great. Yeah, do you want, I'm going to introduce Marlene. Uh, Marlene McCurtis, our next director, um, who is the director of Wednesdays in Mississippi. She has over 20 years of documentary production experience. She's worked as a supervising producer at Arnold Shapiro Productions for seven years, where she produced several documentaries, including the award-winning film Hidden Victims, Children of Domestic Violence, and the historical special Greatest Achievements of the 20th Century. Her directing credits include um, National Geographic's Dog Whisperer, which I want to hear more about, um, <laughs> A&E's Emmy-nominated series, Beyond Scared Straight, and the Peabody Award-winning PBS series, A Place of Our Own, Los Niños on Su Casa. So here you come, and you need your stuff. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, the name of my film is Wednesdays in Mississippi. Uh, my film is a, is a historical documentary set during the Civil Rights Movement. It is the story about the only national civil rights project run by women for women. Um, what happened in 1964, a woman named Dorothy Hyde, I'm wondering how many of you guys know who Dorothy Hyde is? Very few of you, which I'll tell you a little bit about Dorothy really quickly. Dorothy um, was the head of the National Council of Negro Women for 40 years. And she also was an advocate for women and children for over 70 years. Um, but I want to also tell you a little bit about the 18-year-old Dorothy. When she was 18 years old, Dorothy was accepted to Barnard College. And she came here, um, and she got here about 20 minutes late for her interview, and she was turned away. And the reason why was because in 1929, Barnard only accepted two black students. And they had made a mistake that year, and they had accepted three. So when she got here, she, they said, well, you have to come back next year. Um, and the reason why I tell that story is as, as, as we look around the room and as we walk al along this campus, we really can see how Bernard has changed over the years. And that is re the reason why I really want to tell a historical documentary. I think it's really important for us to look at the past and really see that change is possible, even when we think it isn't. It really helps us today to realize that we can make change. So I really hope my film can be kind of a beacon for that. Oh, thank you. So to tell you this really briefly about my film, what it's about is this project Wednesdays in Mississippi. So in 1964, Dorothy Height and our dear friend and colleague Polly Cowan put together teams, interracial teams of women who went into Mississippi quietly, secretly, to meet with black and white women in Jackson, Mississippi. These meetings were behind doors. They were very quiet. No one knew about them. They went there to talk about racial inequality in the most racially violent state in the Union. You can imagine these talks probably were not pleasant all the time, but they did build relationships. And these alliances that the women gr built grew into larger projects, like daycare centers, low-income housing projects, and um, food co-ops. Dorothy and Polly stayed in Mississippi for over a decade, working with black and white women mainly because they brought women down to have conversation. So that's what my film's about. Um, where we're at in terms of our film is that we have just finished production and we're starting to edit. 
Um, and we have a lot of creative challenges. <laughs> so I'm hoping to get some help with that today. Our biggest challenge really is how do we tell this very subtle story, yet complex story, um, in a really compelling and dra dramatic way. So I'm really looking for help for that. Um, the other thing is that our project, Wednesdays in Mississippi, was a secret project. So there's a very little visual materials. So we're really struggling with how to make this film visually compelling. Um, the other thing that I'm also looking for is just help in terms of community outreach and engagement. I really feel as though this film could be used as, an, as a tool for um, activists to really bring people together to have conversation about difficult subjects. So um, that's basically it. Let's see the clip. Okay. Great. We'll put this on here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We got involved in civil rights activities as soon as we got there. And our house was always being watched. I had freedom riders in my house because if they needed a place to sleep, where could they go? As far as my neighbors were concerned, I was a troublemaker. When my husband desegregated his office, the senior nurse said, Dr. Hendrick, word is going to get around and you're going to end up an all nigger doctor, and I don't intend to be a nigger nurse. Shut your mouth and stay still. That was the attitude. We were open about race. We thought it was terrible the way it was. We didn't know what to do. I was determined that we needed to make a change, and I was going to be a part of that change. We realized that the women of Jackson were saying to us, we need help. We need outside help. Please try. So we decided to try. We began to draw up this plan, which became known as Wednesdays in Mississippi. I was 43 years of age when I went to work with the Wednesday in Mississippi project. I traveled to Mississippi with Helen Minor, the wife of the governor of the state of New Jersey at that time, Robert Minor. Warren Buffett's wife, Susie Buffett, wanted to know if any one of us was interested in this project of women going to Mississippi. And I said, I'll go. I could not walk from this convention hall without first reaffirming my absolute and unshakable stand for segregation of the races at all levels. In Jackson, Mississippi, Medgar Evers was shot as he was entering his home. <laughs> In 1964, the focus turned to Mississippi because it was the most oppressive climate for African Americans in the South. Mississippi was like a different country. The three civil rights workers who disappeared in Mississippi. It was not the United States of America that I knew. You just felt you had to be on your toes every moment. The women in Jackson, who were sympathetic to the whole movement, were frightened. I mean, there was just so much fear. They didn't know if the kinds of things they were doing or the conversations they were having among themselves would be reported back to the authorities. The police chief was a good friend of my husband. He would tell my husband, why don't you just let your wife stay home and mind her own business? It was a climate that made it hard, but that was why what we were trying to do was all the more important. The idea was that they would try to work with women who wanted to bridge the racial divide in the South. They believed that by opening lines of communication, they would open the way for an integrated society. In 1964, Groups of black and white women went down to Mississippi on a weekly basis. It was just like going undercover. Only our family members and the Attorney General's office were to know about this trip. My folks were really against it. They were, they were scared. 
Josie, you and her husband sat down and talked about whether she could go. What if she got killed? Would he be able to bring up her daughters? We decided that I should go and that we would risk it. I just made up my mind I was going to do it. I didn't care what other people thought. The black community, because of their struggle, welcomed us being there. The white women were petrified. It was terrible. She said, if anybody sees me here, I'm through. I think they were in total shock. When I came in with Mrs. Minor, I don't think they were expecting a black woman at that meeting. If insiders wouldn't do it, I guess we needed outsiders to do it. This is one thing I think we ought to forget, that in the darkest days, there were white as well as black women who wanted to see segregation ended. But they could not do it together. The contribution we could make would be to facilitate those women coming together. It was an exciting experience. <laughs> Can't help but get that. You're in the midst of change. Could never be recreated. It was really a very a privilege to be there for me. It's freedom. Said it's freedom time now. It's freedom. Said it's freedom time now. While everybody's coming up, I should say Barnard did try and make it up to Dorothy Height later because that was just awful. Come on up. Yeah. Come on. Okay. Yeah, no, but it's totally, totally fair. Let's not. Okay. Yes. We have a, we have, oh gosh. All right. I'm going to now put my chair over that so nobody knows. Okay. Um, yes. Thank you for pinch hitting again, Judith. <laughs> okay. So we have. Let's use that. Yes. yes. Great. Okay. So after Marlene is Penelope yes. Falk, um, who is best known for her work on Joan Rivers, another great Barnard grad, a piece of work. That was a fantastic documentary, um, which won me, at, at the Sundance Award. And also you were involved in Maiden Trip, which has, was the editor, yeah. which has uh, I think, a bunch of you have seen here, right? Okay. We have to hurry up, so I'm going to skip on. Um, <laughs> the next person is Caitlin down at the end. Caitlin Boyle, who is is a pioneer of grassroots distribution for indie films, um, co -fo or founder of Film Sprout, a boutique film um, outreach company, basically. Does that mm -hmm. sound right? Anyway, among the movies that you guys have helped find audiences are The Invisible War, A Small Act, Pray the Devil Back to Hell, which uh, was amazing, and King Corn, among others. She has a background at NPR and various PBS affiliates as well, like everybody seems to hear, and is on the board of the Do Brooklyn Dock Center Union Docks. Okay, so as to Marlene's question. Um, okay, so I'm an I'm a independent editor, documentary editor. That's all I've done for 15 years. And I was, I'm approaching this as if I was called for a job. And I was given this, I, and Marlene said, here's a trailer, what do you think? And this is my, my first question to you, biggest question to you, is, um, well, let me back up. Wow, like these women are incredible. And I also, I told you this already, like I'm a big history buff. I don't know anything about this history. I want to know about this history. I'm hooked, I'm hooked. But my first and biggest question is what is the story? I see a lot of themes. I don't see a narrative. I don't see a plot. Yeah. I don't see, it's a great setup. Right. But then what happens? Yeah, what we're struggling with. That, that's a, yeah, <laughs> that's gonna be. Don't forget, okay. you gotta hold yeah. that, sorry. Yes. And that's what we're struggling with. Um, the other thing I would say, if you were calling me up for a job, would be, um, this is a big, and I've done other historical documentaries, I'm sure you're struggling with this too, is the, that we've all seen the civil rights, and we've all seen the footage of the KKK, and it loses a punch. And I actually love the footage of the women, the home movies, I love that stuff, I just want to eat that up. But you're going to have, another challenge is how do you make me feel Mississippi in the silver, it's at this time, in a new way? And I am not a fan of reenactments at all, but I wonder if you can do something artistic. That's going to be an artistic challenge, and 
for you, because I think that you're seeing that footage of the civil rights, I don't know about, I'm curious on what other people think. I don't glaze over, that's harsh, but it doesn't, I de it doesn't have the impact. And you've got to hit the impact on that because it's such an important story. Um, and so I would ask you, what is the style of your film? I don't, because I don't think you should do your traditional, I don't think it's, I think there's, you have to push it to, for it to resonate and not do like the KKK and, and, and I, and I've been I've been in this I've been in this situation before. It's hard, it's really it's hard, but very doable. And my last comment would be I love the specific. There's a lot of general statements in this film, but in this trailer I know it's just a trailer. I just want you to know I love the details. I love the sheriff telling me um, don't show up. The specificity. I think in films what's important is character and plot. You definitely have character, and I'm sure in the interviews that you have more, you can tease out more of who they are. I have no question about that. And now I really need the plot. Um, and then, can I ask you? Am I allowed to, I don't know how this works. Of course you can. Like, what is the story? Like, the story. Well, we're struggling with the story. I mean, I think that we've gone back from, at one point we're going to tell the story of Dorothy Height and Polly Cowan, because right. here you have these two women who, um, one was African American, one was Jewish. They come together in 1963, right after the right after the March on Washington, when Dorothy Height was not allowed to speak because she was a woman. So you have this level of sexism that's kind of and that's a theme that's happening in you know Madman America at that point. We were talking about trying to do that, but then what we discovered, and this is really working with my editor, that is that our women are so interesting. So. We're not sure yet whether we tell the story of Dorothy Height and Polly Cowan and their relationship, and through that we let the Wednesdays in Mississippi story unfold. I mean, that's really what we're thinking about at this point. Well, that gives you a structure. Right, that right. You, which is yeah, that's what we're thinking about. And then, you know, putting our women in at, you know, in, in, in that structure. That's what we've been thinking about. It's not reflected here because we felt like we didn't want to start the story that way. So this is kind of more a new approach of us, how we're going to get into the movie. Right. We're kind of playing with that right now. Right. So. Right. That's Caitlin, you want to go next? And Judith, you can back clean up. Yeah, sure. So I think um, I, I actually agree. I was, I was looking for um, the character development that happens to specific women over time or to women who are forming specific relationships over the course of um, these meetings. And I think that I think that's something that viewers crave in general. And I think that if you're looking for the film to be used in forums where it can be used for community engagement or um, as an outreach tool, I think that's what your audiences are going to crave. They're, they're going to be attracted to the themes because of the people, not the people because of the themes. Um, even though as like a quick you know, elevator pitch, you got to get to the themes. You know, oh, did you know that like, I mean, especially I think what's fascinating is that white women are flying in from you know, cities that are not experiencing the same level of racism and segregation and the same fight for civil rights and they are putting themselves in that place and that's what's surprising. So that's your that's the elevator pitch to get people to say in 30 seconds what are you working on? But to get people to sit through a feature length film and feel engaged the whole time and then want to tell their friends and want to use it as a teaching tool, um, I think you're going to need to like really dig into some of the transformation, the personal transformations that happen to specific women um, that continue to surprise us, that, that continue to spin out surprises over the course of, um, or, of, you know, of the film. And I think that that's, you know, that makes a good film, but if you're trying to have your film sort of leave an impression with people once um, you know, the lights are up, that proverbial moment when you've either galvanized people or, or not, I think that um, that sort of like very nitty gritty, anecdotal, from the heart, emotional stuff is what's going to stick with people even more so than just you know the sort of facts of history that are also surprising could give you a good premise okay audience get ready you're up as soon as oh. no i know i want them to think yeah. well don't worry you know yes yeah. okay. no she well, is I, I just want them to be thinking because um, we're going to call i am i I, I, I resp I, I, it's so funny that you both said sort of nuts and bolts and specificity because I, so I'm responding to this as someone who probably watches like a thousand trailers a year. Um, and sometimes, uh, honestly, sometimes I read the material beforehand or sometimes I just sort of like pop it in and then I read what they, what they said. 
So I did, but I know I read. I so I did both. You know, I because I watched it this morning and I watched it again. So I read your description, and there was something that really, really, really moved me. So I was kind of looking for it in there, and then I didn't see it in there. So I, and I, so I agree with what everyone's saying, and maybe this will just amplify it a little bit. And from a funding perspective too, um, like when you said that at the, because of what they were able to do. There were grassroots organizations and small local economic development sort of laboratories that have turned into organizations or jobs or something like that that sort of exists now. I know there's a lot of people in the funding world, like from Ford to MacArthur down, who are all kind of trying to figure out sort of the intersection of race and economic development and the long, horrible arm of segregation and how do you change that? Everyone's trying to figure out, like, how does change happen and how does change stick? So it's amazing to see that map and it's amazing to know that there were these, these conversations and these women came down and that they understood that there was strategy every step of the way. So the specificity that I was missing and, and maybe it could help with trying to figure out visually how do you do this. I'm really hungry for the strategy because mm -hmm. I think that's what's missing. I think in most, and it's like from an organizing perspective, it's like how did the campaign work? How did she move the base? Why did those people vote for her? How did she do that? That's actually what um, organizers are all looking for. Like all the people that are going to be looking at this movie, they really want a road map. They don't just want, so they're, they're going to be fascinated by that big general thing and then they're going to want that. <laughs> So if you could find, I think for you, like if you could find a couple of these stories that are both emotional, that work from the heart, but also that for you to decide, you know, which of the myriad stories are you going to look for, the ones that give you the most strategy, the ones where there's like some paperwork and there's nuts and bolts, and you actually understand. I want to know, like they came during a specific summer, like why did they come then? How did it work? How did they meet in the houses? Like all of that stuff, yeah. I think is really necessary um, and then if you know and then if, if those could be tipped off with like this you know the emotional piece and what was at stake and what it was like to build these relationships I, I think that that would be incredibly helpful and then but always try to tie it back to that like how does it link back to those the organizations that stayed that we could still see 40 50 years later I think that's going to help you then know like who are going to be the organizations that are going to want to partner to see the screening. Everyone's going to have a stake in the game. Okay, great. We have. I think we might have time for two. Here's one. I, mean, I love your maps. Love your maps. Yeah, yeah the maps are the cool. Maps are hard, so. <clears throat> Hi. Um, thank you so much for making this uh, film. My mother grew up in Mississippi, and she raised me in Connecticut on stories about Jim Crow in Mississippi. So one thing I'm interested in is uh, less about Dorothy and Polly, and more about, I mean, I know, for instance, that there were white women college students who went to Greensboro and did the sit-ins. There were, these women were apparently middle-class white women that they went down and talked to and that participated. And for me, what would be really interesting and have a lot of impact is what was it that had these women encounter race differently? I mean, these are women who have black maids. They see black people every day of their lives. They're, but something, one hopes, something happened in them because of these conversations. And because the country, some people would say, has become more southern since then, it would be a, a fabulous impact to show what made these white women change. What was it about these conversations, these women in the middle of the closed society where so many people left, whites as well as blacks, left Mississippi because of this stuff, what allowed them to move? Good. Do we have one more question? There's one right there on the aisle, second to last row. Yeah, I just I thought I recognized that face. Right, yeah, yes, I'm sorry. I, there's Susie Goodwillie um, is here with us. She. I thought I was crazy. I no, no, yeah, there like, she I, is. I, I this is Susie. She's in the audience. Susie was in Mississippi in 1964. Um, she was half of the staff that was there. Um, and she's our, as I say, she was our teenager. Yeah. <laughs> the story is indeed the Mississippi women who asked for this to happen. 
They knew it was March of 1964. They knew the Freedom Summer was going to happen. They knew the state was going to be invaded by these thousand college kids. And they knew they were going to be in trouble and they needed help. And that's, that was the inspiration. It was a meeting in, in, uh, in where was it, Atlanta in March. Anyway, um, <laughs> that's, that's the setup. Yeah, we didn't, yeah, we did, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, there you go. Okay, let's see if we can squeeze you in and then. Good. I would love to talk to you about that. The woman you were just talking to? Right there. Yeah, I, I was actually going to. I'm, I'm so glad you said that because I was going to say that the story of what would make white women go down and do this is actually less interesting to me than, than, um, than the black women. And, and white women in Mississippi, people who had everything on the line. Yeah, it's nice you know, that people were willing to risk their lives and, and go down and it's great, and it's, but, but you can get carried away in the idea that you can make a change. It's much harder when you're in it to have the courage. So. Okay, do we need to, next time? Yeah, do, do you want to any, respond? Anything that you heard um, from these guys? I, well, I think everything, I, first of all, I want to thank you so much for your feedback and everything I've heard is really very helpful and it's really giving me seeds to think about. You've really planted some great seeds. Thank you. All right. Okay. So, the yes, I good. We, I think we made up the time, and I'm sorry that uh, we had to go a little shorter on the intros. I hope no one feels this slighted in any way. Um, I will introduce Dawn. Uh, our, our final director is Dawn Porter, and her film is Trapped. Um, she founded Trilogy Films in 2007. Her feature documentary directorial debut, Gideon's Army, was just on HBO after winning prizes at Sundance and uh, and she was she's won all kinds of watch this woman's docs prizes and that's as quick as I can go come on up here and tell them about your movie um, thank you for being here I'm, I'm really thrilled to see you all come out um, this is a very important um, event when you're starting a film because it is really hard to just get started so I really actually appreciate you all being here um, particularly Melissa for giving us this opportunity um, it's really invaluable um, my film trapped is about uh, two abortion clinics that are trying to stay open they are operating in the deep south against a backdrop of politics that has become increasingly anti-choice um, what uh, I actually read about the clinic in Mississippi there's only one clinic left in the whole state of Mississippi only one public clinic and there are four in the state of Alabama um, and all of them are under siege so I'd actually like to show you um, hello person yes I'd like to show you um, a graphic that I think will point out to you oops we really need wait can you hold on can you can you start it over because it's yeah you can't see it with the lights the lights have to go off to see it so um, so let me just set up the graphic before you play it okay so, <laughs> yeah. the, this is a map of the United States, um, and on the upper left is a clock that shows, don't play it, just hold it. <laughs> All right, on the upper left, what you're going to see in just a minute, as soon as I cue our lovely, helpful person, is a map of the United States and the countdown is uh, it's from 2010, so it's before the 2010 election. And then as 2010 progresses through, two, through 2013, you'll see the anti-choice laws um, graphically depicted. Play the graphic. <laughs> so watch the counter. Um, everyone remembers 2010 and that uh, post-Obama election. So the country goes red. And then you start to see anti-choice legislation. All of this happened since that election. And so this is the backdrop against which these two clinics are trying to stay open. Um, and the person who's saying Jesus, like that's what I thought. I thought, Jesus, I didn't know that. I didn't know that this is happening. And so this is where we are today. There have been more there's been more anti-choice legislation that has been passed since 2010 than in all the time since Roe. 
all the time. And as a result, while Roe v. Raid may still be um, in place, um, all of that legislation is threatening public clinics. There's another piece to this that was really interesting to me, which is um, how disproportionately affects women of color and poor women, because those are the women that use public clinics. So it's not enough to have a right if you don't have access to any clinics. So what trapped follows uh, Dr. Willie Parker, who is an African-American doctor from Alabama originally, but he lives in Chicago, Illinois, and he flies on his days off to Alabama and Mississippi and he does abortions because no doctors in those states will do them. The state, both Mississippi and Alabama, have passed legislation that forbids uh, doctors from, per from performing abortions unless they have admitting privileges. And although he's credentialed at Northwestern and in Washington, D.C., um, and has a uh, master's from Harvard, no hospital in Mississippi or Alabama will credential him. So without a doctor, you can, you can get around a lot of bars. You can't get around not having a doctor that will do the procedure. And so that's what the film's about. Abortion is a racist industry. Planned Parenthood is the nation's largest abortion provider, and it was started by Margaret Sanger, and she was a racist, and she actually said that she, one reason for it was to get rid of the weeds of society. Uh, and the majority of people who do get abortions, especially here, are young, young black females. What would you say is now the number one cause of death in the African American community? Since 1973, legalized abortion has killed more black Americans than AIDS, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and violent crimes combined. Learn more at blackdignity.org. Part of the anti-choice narrative recently seems to have been to, to focus on the idea of black genocide with abortion, and that from a medical and public health point of view, we know that that's a complete fallacy. We recognize that part of why women of color have statistically more abortions, it's because they have more unintended pregnancies, because they are disenfranchised from the medical system in general, and in particular from reproductive health care and preventative medicine, such as contraception. These are women doing the best they can in already challenging circumstances. First, we had to have a transfer agreement with the hospital, so we got that. Next year, it was admitting privileges by a physician on staff, and our backup doctor had that. Uh, and then they passed the every doctor had to have admitting privileges, and that's the one that we just couldn't meet. I'm Dr. Parker, and I'm one of the doctors here, Jackson. I'm one of two doctors who flies into Mississippi to provide abortion care for women. There are no doctors in Mississippi who provide care. As you know, it's a very hostile environment. It is your right to decide whether or not to continue a pregnancy. So for that reason, I come to make sure that you can exercise that right. Buddy. Having Buddy around is like having a two-year-old is really obnoxious. I'm still dealing with new regulations from the state forcing us to set ourselves up as office-based surgeries with moderate sedation. Moderate sedation means you put somebody into a, an unconscious state where they can't get up and move and so forth, and we don't do that to patients. Um, we use minimal sedation, but the new standard says that we had to say that we did that even when we didn't. Um, it forces us to lie um, because we have to be compliant with whatever they're asking us to do, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but you know, a lot of this doesn't make a lot of sense. It says emergency lighting shall be provided in accordance with section 7.9. And there is no 7.9. Hence, they call these trap bills. It's like trying to work your own crossword puzzle. I, I work crossword puzzles very, very well. I just don't do it when you have to make the own, your own puzzle up. I would 
say 60% of the patients that I see are below poverty level. So these are women that are already struggling with their families as it is, and, and the state stepping in and trying to make these decisions is just appalling to me, just appalling. This first patient is a 14-year-old who was gang raped uh, by three guys and a girl and she is now 12 weeks pregnant and um, she's never had a pelvic exam before. We don't have any narcotics or any other sedative to give her so the only real sedative I have to offer her is by gaining her trust and reassuring her that um, we're going to take good care of her. The reason I'm doing this now is so I can even see if you can tolerate the procedure. If you can't tolerate this, we can't do it. I'm not gonna hurt you, but I, I know you're scared, and I know you don't wanna be here, but that's why I'm doing this first, so that when we do it the next time, you already know what to expect. The thing that we see a lot of is the issue of access to care. I see patients um, every week who you know, are working three minimum wage jobs and taking care of their three kids. And to be able to take time off work and afford lost wages and arrange for childcare and transportation and maybe they're in a state with a waiting period and so they need to travel two times, that the barriers that have been put up in front of women, it's like they're trapped. Um, and I, I really see that as a, a deep injustice. out the chair so you don't trip over okay. that thing. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to introduce people as you're walking up to make out time. This is Andrea Miller, who's president of NARAL Pro-Choice New York and the National Institute for Reproductive Health. Um, and I think probably everyone in this audience knows what they do. Um, and she's had a, a long career working in these areas here and in Massachusetts, right? Next is, next to her, is Christy Marchese, who has uh, launched Picture Motion in May 2012, which is, again, social impact um, film marketing. Um, it, this past year, Fruitvale Station, I bet a lot of you saw Inequality for All, American Promise, God Loves Uganda, and The Crash Reel. And then, again, going as fast as I can, Chris Hegedus, um, who is the only person on our stage today who actually won an Athena Award, so I'd like to give her a round of applause for that. <laughs> from an earlier uh, festival. And she, you probably saw Startup.com. She was nominated for an Oscar for The War Room, which she co-directed with her partner, D.A. Pennebaker. And um, most recently, Kings of Pastry, right? Anyway, so now, let's go, let's get down to this. Would you like to dive in? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for tackling this incredibly difficult subject and say how excited I am, having worked on these issues for more than 20 years, to see film and cultural mediums that can really, I think, do more and in some ways do better than what we can as advocates because you can educate and inspire people to act by telling these incredible stories. And I can tell the story, but you tell it much better through this medium. A couple of things that really strike me in looking at this. Um, first of all, this is incredibly complicated, right? You've got your map, you've got all these different restrictions, you've got all these different, you know, the, the sort of nitty gritty of the regulations. I mean, you've got a lot going on here, and I think that's going to be one of the greatest challenges in telling this story. Um, there are two things that really strike me as an advocate, and, and having seen things like the film um, about after Tiller, um, and sort of the conversation that has started, and it started it around something very complicated, but it focused on a couple of very specific things about the providers, the women, and, and later procedures. And I think your story, as, it, as I start to see it, is there are two things that are fundamentally shaping why we're in such trouble on these issues. One is that these regulations and these efforts to uh, essentially regulate the provision of abortion uh, out of existence so that Roe versus Wade can be here but you can't ever get an abortion is most 
of the time is playing on the assumption that abortions are unsafe, that these regulations are medically necessary. Now, people in this room were nodding and, and sort of hissing at some of the ridiculousness. And the ridiculousness, the crossword puzzle reference, all of that is fantastic. But you also have to, and I think can use this as an opportunity to educate in a way that says, in fact, abortion is incredibly safe. These are completely medically unnecessary restrictions, and their sole purpose is to, turn, is to er eradicate the provision of abortion care and to eliminate these clinics. So one is, you know, get at that, because I think that's central to this. Um, second, that people assume that abortions are incredibly available. In fact, some assume that they're more available than they should be. Um, again, I think that contextualizing this, and it's not just about Mississippi and Alabama, it's actually all across this country. So I think those two pieces, I think you have an incredible opportunity with this film to hone in on. The second thing about the stories, and then I want to turn it over to the experts here on film, um, <laughs> is um, you know, the race piece is, is so intense. And I really encourage you, I mean, I know Willie, he's an amazing spokesperson. He's an incredibly compassionate physician, as you can see. And I think thinking about how he can speak to this without speaking to it head on because of who he is, as opposed to having a talking head talking about how this is trying to use race in a really ugly way. So just encourage you on the sort of story and thinking about how to really um, utilize his story and who he is and how that really is emblematic of, of why we need these services and why someone like him does this and flies down and does this and does it in such a compassionate way. So I really encourage you to, to uh, think about utilizing um, his storyline even more because I was waiting for that and I didn't see it in the clip. Christy? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm really thankful that this film is coming out. Um, I've been uh, following it for a while. I think I saw a piece of it at IFP Week. And I've been, like everybody else, kind of tracking over the last few years, seeing these laws pop up more and more, and seeing this happen over and over again, and never quite understanding what was happening um, and, and why this was becoming more popular. So I'm really excited as an activist and interested person to see this film. Um, I don't have any responses to the storyline because I loved Gideon's Army. I think it's going to be a great film when it's done. I'm not a filmmaker. Uh, I'm really curious about how, how this is going to get out there because, and, and I know working with groups like NARA will be so key, um, how are you going to get people to, to buy tickets to this? And I think a big part of it is, is having a campaign that's not just going to be in theaters. It's going to be bringing it to every, every uh, state, every moment that these laws are about to get passed. And I think, in my, my minimal understanding of this, is looking at what's working, like what is stopping these trap laws. And, you're, you, and you know this better than I do. But um, there's been a couple things popping up. So you have the, the federal court blocking some of these things from going through. So while well, these are passing on a state level, there, there's some sort of thing in place that says these put undue burdens on women. And that's, um, yeah. So Unfortunately, you have we're not. We don't, we're not winning these in the courts. Not that. So there's, uh, I'm, yeah. So, so we really is there, need the yeah, is there, like, is, is that an opportunity? Who needs to see the film on that level then? And then is it the grassroots movements? Who are the key figures? Who are the, who are the next Wendy Davises that you can get behind this film? And so finding those, how do you move people locally in the states where this is happening? Find those key figures. And then on a, on a federal level, is there any opportunity for this film? So I'd be curious to, to see how you're going to do that. I want to thank you for making it as well. Um, it's a very meaningful film for me because I grew up at a time when abortion was illegal in this country and lots of friends of mine had very botched abortions by um, you know, non-professional doctors. Um, so it's always meaningful for, for me to have films too and I wondered if you were going to do this, kind of get that sense of America. And we were there back in Nicaragua where we were talking about this earlier. Um, also, um, I just, you know, I think you have some very strong characters. I wondered if you were going to get more because, I mean, this whole subversive minority legal trap laws that are going on, are you going to follow any, um, in the way that you did with Gideon, um, people who are more on the legal political spectrum in terms of um, what they're doing, what that battle is? Because it's, it's interesting and it's another aspect um, besides kind of seeing the challenges for both the doctors, the patients, whatever, if that was going to be an aspect. Um, I hadn't thought about doing that, but that's, um, that's a really interesting idea. And on next week, I'm interviewing um, the Center for Reproductive, okay. so Nancy Northrup, who runs the center and is um, out of New York. There's, there's a, 
a group that does legal representation. So they're representing the Mississippi Clinic, but also helping with the strategy for the other clinics. Not to say that the local lawyers aren't doing it, but the, I think that's a really great idea, actually. I think I was a little like, I don't want to always be lawyer girl, so, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but it's, it's a good point to not mm. avoid the story because of my own drama. <laughs> Um, I mean, I would just say that the, these, the grassroots, I think, is going to be a really critical component to this, and I think we're really primed at this point. For your film, it's incredibly timely, and I know we'd be thrilled to work with you to get it out there and to engage people around it, both to get the word out for your film, but also to use it as an organizing tool. I think that it really does provide an incredible opportunity for that. And I think these films uh, along these lines are going to be really essential to shifting the dial back. And I, I do think that we've seen, you know, you referenced Wendy Davis. I mean, we saw in Virginia when it became a very simple, straightforward story about the level of interference and the vaginal ultrasounds. Everyone probably is going to nod. You all remember that. In Texas with Wendy Davis. I mean, we've just seen that there are those very specific storylines that bring people out. And I think that that's really what I think you're about to do with this which is why I think it's such a tremendous piece of work. I mean, one of the things I'm struggling with is, because it's happening all over, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is how to give a sense of that without collapsing the movie as a movie. Um, so, like, I, we're going to go down to Texas, because I, right as I was just, like, I was like, I'm just going to focus on Alabama and Mississippi, and it's going to be their story. And then Texas is, is just this monster that's happening, so we're going to go to Texas. Um, but I don't know how you feel about multiple character lines happening at the same time. They're slightly different, but they're all, I mean, they're connected, and that's, that's kind of why I, the first thing I did when I got some money, well, the second thing after shooting, um, Chicken and Egg actually gave us our emergency Yay, money because I was <laughs> on a plane doing something else, and I was like, Judith, I have to, I have to shoot, I have to shoot so much, and she's like, What are you talking about? <laughs> but then they gave me the money, <laughs> so I was able to shoot initially. <laughs> but sometimes it does. <laughs> But I, I felt like the map was important because even, like, I knew it, but, like, seeing it just made me feel like, oh, good Lord. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know how you all feel about different stories um, happening the at the same time. I think the graphics are great. The yeah. graphics will help tell that story a lot. Um, so as you're doing these interviews and as you're meeting with the Center for Reproductive Justice and interviewing them, are you, at the same time, are you kind of organizing in a way or kind of talking to them off camera about how you could work with them for the distribution? Um, I was more thinking that they could get, be the legal backdrop, that they could orient us and say, this is like she could basically narrate that map and say, this is what's happening yeah. across the country, but also to understand what the legal strategy is, because it's a fascinating medical, it's, it's also a perversion of state rights. I mean, the mm -hmm. state has abdicated its healthcare responsibility and is not regulating the clinics for healthcare purposes, they're regulating them for harassment. And so private groups have stepped in. I mean, it's a really interesting political science question too, I think, so. Um, I think you see that, you really want to see it happen as much as you can without telling it. I, I know that's a lot of being there, like mm -hmm. work or finding out, but I think that that's, you know, the most potent parts of it are when you see it in action. Mm -hmm. I think that, that's really helpful. So we have a question coming from Daphne, another great Barnard alum, Daphne Phillips. Hi, um, yeah, and a Planned Parenthood board member. Um, I think since you raised the issue of the two um, agitators outside the clinic, I'm talking about Margaret Sanger and um, making it a racist thing. In addition to the doctor that you mentioned speaking out, if you could get some more members of the African American community to counter act that because that's a really strong thing when you hear somebody saying well you know abortions are killing all black babies you know you really have to have you know even if you could get um, Gwen um, my favorite House of Representatives lady from Michigan you know Gwen um, she's the one that said keep your rosaries off of my ovaries she's my hero <laughs> Gwen Moore Gwen Moore but you know people like that to um, you know maybe have a soundbite and um, counteract because you introduce these guys, so we have to have somebody who speaks against them. Here's another hand back there, and then there. 
Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you've reached out to politicians down there as well, because it was touched on a little bit, but these are regulations being put in place without medical knowledge, and so much between with doctors having to try to deal with these regulations that make no sense for medical purposes. So I think speaking to politicians and getting more of like, okay, well, why did you do this, or how did you decide this law? Um, it could also show shine light on the fact that these aren't being made with a lot of medical input. Okay, we'll move the front row over here, and then we'll move to this side again. Um, Don, I saw Gideon, and I honestly thought it was one of the best document. It's a tough year. There were really good documentaries this year, and I saw it because it's on the Spirit Award list in the list of best documentaries for the Independent Spirit Award this year. So it came in my packet. Everybody clap. <laughs> <laughs> it's phenomenal. Um, with respect to this film, I, I think you've got so much going on in Alabama and Mississippi and this racial aspect which is new and very, very troubling that you might want to really be careful about not spreading yourself too wide um, because my first question is where's the money coming from to support this and is this I, I, I shudder to say this because it's such a scary thought, but is this a way to get black men against black women who, you know, so you, you've got a lot of sensitive stuff here and, and I, you know, I, again, like others, I commend you for taking this on. I commend all three uh, that we've seen today. These are three tremendous projects and uh, wow. <laughs> okay. Do we have time for one more, Melissa? What do you think? Okay. There was a hand over here, and otherwise there's a hand there. Right here. Okay. Wait, we're not missing the Barnard student. <laughs> we got to get the Barnard student in. Um, hi. So going back to someone who mentioned reaching out to politicians, and uh, you showed um, the maps uh, showing the change from, like, the red map, you know, and I think it is like valuable to understand like that an audience can be very valued and going back to who it is that you're trying to speak to um, there are like the monsters and there are the very um, irrational thinking people but there are also many people who probably think that they have a perfectly logical reason for thinking of this and you can thinking these things and I felt disconnected from who who's the bad guy you know um, and I mean, I, and I would touch on the, I, I really like the personal emotional aspect, like when you talk about race and showing the 14 year old girl, because personally, as a, as a young female, the only part that I see of these struggles are the ridiculous reality TV shows, like 16 and Pregnant. I don't see real, real stories of before and after an abortion of a young girl. and. Um, I think that could really touch someone. Okay, do you want, Melissa, do we have time for one or two more? Yeah. Okay, the woman on the we'll aisle there. Um, continuing at that about the audience, and Andrea Miller brought up the After Tiller film, which um, was seen by a lot of anti-choice folks, and um, some people thought maybe influenced the ballot measure in the um, city in New Mexico where the two doctors featured in the film um, practice. There was a ballot measure on the ballot in November, and it was a very expensive <laughs> fight. Um, and so but I was wondering. Wanted. Yes, which we, we won. won it. Which that's, we won. That's the important thing. When <laughs> this goes to people, we win. Yes. Even the hard issues, we win. And so my question is, how are you considering both the anti-choice viewer as well as supporters? Um, uh, so to do like a yeah. roundup, um, I wanted to hear from people, and this is really, really incredibly helpful. I can't even explain to you how helpful it is because um, there are so many things. One of the reasons I chose Dr. Parker is because he's black and because he's religious, and that's very important to him, and he won't cede either his religious beliefs or his southernness or his maleness or his background uh, to an anti-choice narrative. Um, he does, uh, one of the things we're going to film him do is he does uh, 
teaching sessions for physicians in order to help them, for white physicians who are being affected by this idea that their black genocide is happening. Um, it's one of the things that actually is emotionally even is very taxing on some of the, the few providers that will go. Um, I, I um, the, what was the last question? The anti-choice people. Um, you know, I kind of feel like you have to make the film you want to make, and like people are going to do with what they do, and if people want to pervert it or use it for their own bad purposes, that like shame on them. Um, but um, I feel like what I'm interested in is what is it like to be a person who's fighting for reproductive choice and access in this oppressive climate, and um, and I, I think like it's very important to me as a filmmaker to be as fair as possible to people who are. So when you're like, who's the enemy? You know, like I don't know if there's an enemy. There are people who are fighting things, and, and I think um, the enemy is, it sounds corny, but is kind of indifference, and that's, to me, the point of the map is, so while people are yelling at each other on Fox News, that map happened, and there's real world consequences to that map, um, which I think people disagree with. So, um, so I'm less interested in demonizing anybody than in trying to understand the, the political process a little bit. Um, and I, there was one other thing. I'm sorry, I forgot. Can I just uh, say a couple words to, to close this? Firstly, Cindy, thank you so much in wrangling all the, <laughs> the troops, the ambitious... Speed, speed talking. The ambitious um, <laughs> agenda for today. And um, as I said, when we started, this was a, a new endeavor, and I'd love to get your feedback. So you'll all get a survey and, you know, really be honest, like what works here, what didn't work here, how would you see it improve? Because we want to make these experiences work for the audience as well as for the filmmakers. Um, what our, one of the goals was to have the filmmakers have meet some people in this business who could be their team, you know, who they could go to, to ask questions and occasionally get advice as they do this journey. And I want to thank all the people who gave their time today to help these filmmakers uh, think about things a little differently and thank the filmmakers for putting together these pieces mm -hmm. to come here today. Um, and uh, did you have any uh, final thoughts, uh, Cindy, that you want to um, Mainly just that, no, I thought, I mean, I thought all these things were amazing. It was really fun to see. I, I actually could, felt for one little bit of feedback is that we could have gone longer on any of these, which is why, again, I apologize to the second and third panels that I, they didn't really get much of an introduction. But Maybe we do a half day work in progress or yeah, something I mean, in the future. These are all Everybody gets an meaty, hour or something like yeah, that. Yeah, meaty topics, and I'm sure there, there's a ton more that any any of you could have said to any of the filmmakers and the audience and as well. hopefully that they'll give them more feedback in the future in private and um, but you I hope it just tantalize them to support the film and these are out. such great stories that need to be told and that's you know hope I uh, hope we see them uh, shortly and thank you again so much for your for your time and for your feedback thank you oh, one last thing so we have um, closing film uh, paving the way, the Geraldine Ferraro story at six o'clock in the Diana Center. It's the close of the festival, so we'd hope you can all. So congratulations to Melissa for another amazing uh, achievement. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.